your kettle, and I'll be talking about vulnerabilities and fault or virtual disk encryption solutions. Uh, I'm actually the maintainer of digital so I will go first to apologise to people who have actually seen this before, or some variant of it, or even actually heard me speak before there are at least one person that can count this. Unfortunately, we heard this before, so we'll have to sit through it again for another hour. Okay. So, the outline. First of all, I'll go through what I'm actually going to be talking about. Secondly, I'll go through some frequently asked questions because, well, I always get asked the same questions generally. Uh, then we'll just go for a very simple disclaimer that just basically says I don't really know what I'm talking about. Following after that, I'll go through the products and the actual vulnerabilities, which is probably the most interesting part. And uh, then we'll move on to just conclusions. References are there if you actually doubt the quotations. So about me, uh, for those of you who don't know the, uh, what it actually means, uh, it's an English phrase, pull over your own trumpet, so to speak. So I'm a reverse engineer, uh, strictly at night actually, I'm actually unfortunately a pen tester during the day. Uh, I probably want to get out of that at some point, but stick with reverse engineering at night. Other than that, a uh, code review, bug hunter, exploit builder, general nuisance. You know, if you, most people tend to hate my page on Digi Hacks and which basically looks more like an export repository than an actual website. But anyway. Okay, so the focus of this talk, as you can probably guess, uh, will be commercial closed source, full disk and virtual disk encryption solutions for Windows. Uh, and I'll look at them from an implementation perspective. In other words, pretty much non cryptographic. Uh, just what kind of Thanks. What kind of functionality does the implementation provide to use by them? Uh, the purpose of this really was, well, to see lemon in the eyes of the people that shot at actually write this piece of writing software. Furthermore, governments that just basically endorse it, particularly the UK government, who just simply turn a blind eye to its use, even though there are publicly demonstrable vulnerabilities in, in several government, UK government approved software. And we'll actually go through those. Okay, so the first frequently asked question is why bother? Well, uh, this principle is one that I always tend to stick to, and that is the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That is, if you want to write a piece of security software, you should at least try and make it secure, whereas most of the people that you'll see today just simply don't care or are simply capable of doing so. Uh, otherwise, you will be embarrassed at some point, someone will uh, take them in. So as one example, we asked Cisco or Citrix with deterministic network extender. There's a particularly interesting vulnerability because it affected a lot of the 32 VPN clients who discovered this about three years ago. Uh, as you can see at the bottom there, someone from NGS thought it was so useful he tried and actually get the executable copy of the, of the, uh, the exploit from the site. Uh, I don't distribute uh, executable copies of anything on the site simply because I don't want to be accused of distributing malware. Uh, however, this guy obviously you know, doesn't know what a compiler is or just simply doesn't know how to use one, which isn't really all too uncommon with UK pen testers. Uh, I did actually email NGS, one of the directors, and actually said, look, you know, this guy has been trying to download executable copies of exploits on this site. I actually told him that if he didn't tell people not to do it, uh, the next time there will be an executable copy of the exploit there, and it will not be the exploit. <laughs> kind of, uh, after that, I, I haven't received any hits, and, uh, which is, is <laughs> well, to be expected. Uh, other companies that form for it are Secure Test and other parts of NCC, if you happen to know the UK pen testing scene. Uh, the other one is Authentium. You may have seen this just recently, well, about six or seven months ago. <laughs> Particularly Safe Central, which is some real snake oil production that supposedly secures browsers against malware that happens to be on the machine itself. Uh, well, this was actually evaluated, uh, evaluated in inverted commas, by a company called Information Risk Management, which is a UK pen testing outfit. Uh, they actually were ecstatic to see that Safe Central Meta exceeded every claim and indeed is certified to provide true privacy when transacting online. Unfortunately, any book, it's trivial to show that anyone would click the mouse about 20 times and with about five minutes of time. And the smallest of knowledge in Windows 32 kernel internals can 
trivially pregnant, and indeed I did show that. Uh, they weren't too happy about that. Several of their people yeah, emailed me and were rather distraught about how I was conveying the company. However, they kind of did it themselves. If you actually go through the downloads available from Information Risk Management's website, you'll see one called smuggler.c, which contains within it some of the most hilarious pieces of code you've ever seen in your life. And that was actually written by someone who's supposedly a you know, computer security expert. But that's that kind of conversation just implicit, really. You know, the UK penetration testing scene, if you have to be a pen tester, you're automatically a senior pen tester. Okay, so furthermore, why bother? Well, I wish to prove the following. These are long health issues, by the way, over several years, developed really quite tough stuff. Third party windows kernel drives are really terrible, rather simple, uh, but yet yeah, quite hard to work, actually, quite easy to prove. Uh, you probably see from the amount of bugs that get pasted to full disclosure or book track on the average week, although there haven't been many just recently. I think people have been on holiday recently. Anyway. Sales pitches, particular pet hate. Slogans I absolutely love. They really are a little more than self-adulation. Uh, these vendors really do like to say that we offer you complete security, blah, 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 blah as you would expect. Um, however, you know, someone should probably tell them if they actually want to offer security, you should probably hire developers that aren't you know, the evolutionary equivalent of monkeys. In the best case, it's just outright propaganda and lies, which is pretty easy to show. Uh, the first and second thesis is so obviously true, it takes a really good education not to see it, where good education is defined in the ideological sense, that is, you know, you believe everything you're told. Uh, and I happen to come from an academic background, so... Uh, no matter how trivial any implementation is to break, the fact that it is breakable will elicit no response from vendors or otherwise, and this is obviously true, but we'll come to this at the end. Uh, none of the vendors in this actually produce pretty much any patch. Uh, in fact, there's a lot, one company that I'll shortly talk about and we'll have a lot of detail if I have the time. Uh, produced two patches in about three years. One of them didn't actually fix anything. Uh, if you actually look at the uh, release notes, it states quite openly that you know, they fixed memory issues, but uh, didn't actually say what they actually were. Uh, so far, so they just continue to deny that the logic books even exist in their problem, even though I've had government people reporting to. Uh, others, some others I haven't actually told, which is, probably makes me a bit of a naughty boy, but, well, I'll leave that to your pleasure. Okay. <coughs> if our thesis hold, if it takes longer than an hour to find a bug, you're either blind or you are doing something wrong. Uh, I state that rather openly in the fact that I don't actually use more than an hour to look at any kernel driver. If I can't break it within an hour, I just simply give up. Uh, to move on to the next one, there's always another subject. Uh, suggestions as to what information risk management's world renowned security testing team, and that's a quote, members were missing are always welcome. I mean, apparently they took about two weeks to review this. Uh, God knows what they actually did. I mean, they probably just went down a list and ticked a lot of boxes. But that's what world renowned security testing teams do, according to IMM. Anyway. Kernel hacking is interesting and fun, uh, especially given the above, because obviously it's easy then. Uh, the following is actually a quote. Uh, as you can probably guess, it's from someone who runs an apple, and I'm not saying that simply because you can't spell vulnerability. Uh, I'm saying that because he actually puts apple in. Uh, this was uh, in relation to a talk Mike Nick Christa did at Cancer 2009. Uh, this guy obviously thinks it should be an illegal offence to publish vulnerabilities in Apple software, particularly in the kernel, because it puts everybody at risk. I actually replied to this guy and told him rather openly that not only is it not a crime to publish vulnerabilities in Apple software without Apple supplying patches, but I also consider it a hobby. Uh, he really didn't like that one. Uh, <laughs> I can't really show you the context of the email conversation that ensued, but as you can probably guess with people you know, Apple ads, and they really do not like to be spoken down to, they like to be, they like to teach the lessons, not be taught, and, uh, which kind of probably comes from the fact that most of them are just, well, outright fascists. <laughs> <laughs> Kernel exploits aren't really much, well, really worth much any open market, actually. 
well, from my perspective anyway, where I've actually got them. Uh, I actually run an Apple Mac myself. Uh, I mean, that's potentially why I said that not all Apple users can't spell it, because I can spell it. Uh, although, all my Apple's actually bought with money from selling internal exports, so I'm not really one of those people I just choose to use it because it's, you know, it means to an end. Uh, but backdoor full disk computers are certainly are worth money, uh, depending on who wants them. Uh, and there is a market for that. Okay, so why bother with the drive? Uh, absolutely no idea what, how much time I've gone through it. It's a little bit much. Okay. You monitor that. In software encryption, the driver is the implementation. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Uh, to give you an example of a much publicized attack, we this much media for all about this cryogenically frozen ground bypasses old disk encryption methods. I mean, if you actually sit down and ignore the media hype about this and actually think about what is actually required to exploit something like this, I mean, it, it's just beggar's belief, really. I mean, not even Hollywood would write a film or something like this. And, you know, a big Russian guy stood behind him when he working in a government office. I must apologize to any Russians there as a rich guy. It's pretty obvious that my only cultural education comes from watching reruns of James Bond and so all Russians are evil. And he stood there behind you with a whole big cancer, a liquid nitrogen, in one hand with a big glove on, and the other, you know, Philip Screwdriver ready to rip the ram out of the machine. And then obviously he's got to run to the airport, which kind of destroys the whole idea of it anyway, because you can't take more than 100 mils of liquid onto the plane. <laughs> so you know, how, how the hell he does it, I just do not know. So if you actually just, you actually want something that's actually usable, uh, why not have all the drivers? And nobody did for God knows how long, so I decided that I actually would. Uh, well, secondly, I have a potentially unhealthy personal interest in cryptographic implementations. Uh, those that I consider interesting are of unknown origin, hence why it's unhealthy. Uh, I have a particular fondness for collecting binaries of unknown origin. Uh, usually involving Russian strings or look like they come from you know, interesting places. You can judge for yourself what that means. Okay, so when did this start? Well, it started in November 2007, uh, simply because I saw a copy of Deslock up on a you know, file folder where I used to work. Uh, funnily enough, the company where I used to work used to produce two encryption products they no longer do. Uh, for, for those reasons, you'd have to ask them. I'm not allowed to say. Uh, although it probably might have had something to do with me. It was well, very slow going. Uh, I simply don't, just don't have the time to do this, and it's just too many things to document. If anybody wants to offer any help, then that's very much appreciated. Uh, the first product tested, this kind of gave me the impetus to carry on, uh, was Data Encryption Systems Deslock Plus. Apparently, so good they put a plus at the end of it, with great success achieved. Uh, the initial bug reports elicited an extreme reaction. Uh, I'll try not to grab it on for too long about this. Uh, but this basically involved me sending an email at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the 7th of January 2008. Uh, at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I received a phone call on my parents at the time, was at home at the time. And uh, the person at the other end of the phone pretended to be someone from the University of Kent when I studied for a PhD. And as soon as I answered the phone, it hung up. Uh, the next day I received a letter from, uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in Sweden, but it's special delivery, so it's delivered before 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, to sign for, which is a rather interesting letter, you know, written legalese that basically said, you will give us everything you have and you know, we will shut up and what have you. You can actually download the letter from Digi from Labs and make up your own mind on that. Uh, so I actually called them and said, you know, why did you think it was necessary to look me up on the electoral roll? And, Big nuisance telephone calls. And the guy eventually cracked. And he basically said, uh, look, we need to make certain you're not an Eastern European terrorist. And then he went on to say, uh, look, we've made a lot of money from selling this software. Uh, you know, you should just basically insinuating that you just shut and go away. Uh, which, when you say things like that to me, it kind of gets my back up. Give <coughs> you a slap. And this is actually a photo of the guy. Uh, this was taken at InfoSec 2009. Myself and Chris were actually present. I think it was you that I was with when he started calling me a Russian butt farmer. And that's 
pretty much the entire club there from the phone. Listen, I made a lot of money out selling Deslock. We get a lot of threats, emails and the like. How do we know you're not an Eastern European terrorist? Well, that's probably pretty obvious because I had to sign the email, Dr. Neil Kettle. As you gave all my information there, you can just Google me and find my own page at the University of Kent. It's not very hard. And it probably means that me writing the old kettle that sound Eastern European. <laughs> I don't even know any Eastern European terrorist statements. It's Bard and Meinhof, they shut down. They function, they don't exist anymore. Uh, in InfoSet 2009, he was, uh, he, he obviously noticed who I was. He was actually impersonating a salesman at the time, had a different badge on. Uh, and he basically said, oh yeah, you must be the Russian bot farmer that threatens to down our website and wondered if I'd come to collect the protection money. I said, well yeah, I'm obviously stupid enough to turn on to InfoSec and ask for my protection money. I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was having Chinese with, the, uh, with Lynn, and I don't know if you know Lynn, the guy that was arrested at InfoSec for being involved in a fluffy bunny incident, but I'm not really as stupid as him, you know, to do something like that. Please. Frequently from second constantly, or so I'm told anyway. Okay, so onto the disclaimer. Well, I'm not a Win32 internals expert. I know only that which I must, which pretty much isn't much to break the even. All the results were reverse engineered. Uh, and since no one, and since only one of the vendors uh, replied to confirm any technical details, anything in this is you know, caution advised. Uh, all exploitation details will be kept to a minimum. Uh, I found that that's a bit of a fool's errand going into that. Yeah, I just end up getting bogged down trying to explain the, the little bit. Uh, whereas the hilarity of the books themselves are quite often suffices. Uh, the exploits themselves are probably available from digitmaps.org, or if not, in some cases they're not, then you can just ask. Uh, no one has yet. Uh, you can if you want. Uh, in relation to Deslock, I feel I must actually state this because I don't like breaking any of the license agreements, I just like removing copy protection, which isn't really stopped by end user license agreements. So, funny curiosity, if you actually look at end user license agreements, it doesn't actually say you can't remove the copy protection from it, unless you happen to be American. <coughs> Uh, but after reporting many of these vulnerabilities, uh, they actually changed the end user license agreement to explicitly state that you can no longer reverse engineer it. Uh, I wonder why they did that. Uh, I actually emailed the guy back again, to which I received no response. That's probably not so much of a surprise. Uh, stating that in the European copyright conventions, to reverse engineer cryptographic implementation is permitted. Uh, they can't deny you the right to it, although no one has actually used that law, apparently. It's, you know, Pretty much on the waiting testing, in other words, I just hope that you'll try and test it on me. Uh, in response, all the vulnerabilities here are found by premonition, you know, just some psychic guy that happens to think this way. Okay, so we'll move on to the vulnerabilities themselves. Obviously, this guy in the corner here is meant to be a bug, doesn't look too much of a bug. Uh, as you can probably see from the, uh, the actual slogans here, all logos, these people really do love themselves. You know, Deadlock, which of course secure star because obviously the star is right of course makes you better. Computer security, <coughs> Bcrypt, uh, blatant false advertising because I've been around every IRC network and there is no channel called Bcrypt. <laughs> JTCO, protection made perfect. Well, that's well, you can judge yourself what that one means. Okay, first of all, I'll go through a little background. Uh, I assume you probably mostly. Windows coders, in which case you'll know most of the driver and implementation, well, some bits of driver implementation, or uh, how to actually interface and drive some user one, or less, you know, like .NET code. Uh, but I'll give a simple generic driver design as a hint. Uh, to characterize the bugs, because I've been told characterizing bugs helps, uh, the reason someone told me it helps is because it helped the pen test the driver the course. Uh, and it's as per common driver reliability issues. That's a Microsoft document. Uh, pretty simple, pretty good document actually. Uh, misses quite a lot, but the things it does talk about is actually quite good. Uh, you'd be forgiven if you actually read that document, but the reliability there can just be substituted for the word security. And the person who think you'd be right probably tells you something <coughs> about the underlying ideology at Microsoft that security is actually just synonymous with reliability, especially when it comes to kernel books. You see that all the time. 
Okay, so simple and generic driving design, but user land at the top, kernel at the bottom. Uh, the device in this case is actually drive trip, or one of the devices that actually exports about four. God knows what the others do. Uh, that's one thing you'll actually find with these implementations. They were exporting massive amounts of functionality to users. Apparently, in the capitalist economies, uh, your solution is better if it produces more useless information to the user. Um, they basically fight each other to try and produce the most useless information. Uh, so we just call create file with the device. We, we just received back a handle. Note that it is possible to restrict the, uh, the access to these devices. Uh, no one does that. If you think about it, it's very obvious. Uh, any user can mount, well, should be able to mount a virtual disk or full disk or folder based encryption system or whatever the line container. Uh, so these simply have to be accessible to everyone, which is why you get access as guests. Okay, then you just simply call the file, right file, and that's how you control the simple stuff. We'll focus on the side of control uh, because there we go, that's the only function those drivers actually use. Uh, I've seen a couple use right file, uh, God knows why, uh, although I will not cover any of those here. That's, thanks to Apple, that's typically what happens uh, when you happen to just send random garbage to us. It actually removed the slide about fuzzing uh, the drivers. The simple fact that it just gives the wrong message. <coughs> I've never wanted to convey the message you can just fuzz it and find the vulnerabilities and never fuzz uh, a bug in a curve. In fact, I never fuzz the bug in period. Uh, the fact is, you just don't need to fuzz. Uh, it really is true that if you can't only expose in less than an hour, or find uh, bugs in less than an hour, you really are blind or you really are doing something wrong. Uh, actually, I actually gave a talk similar to this at DC4420 in London where I actually found another book and then we took less than about five or six books. Uh, people who are shopping with that and doing that sort of stuff. So device IO control, you've probably all seen this before, we'll actually just focus on uh, manipulation of disk parameters, LP in buffer. Uh, and that's pretty much all I'll say about, all I'll say about that. Okay, so moving on, Desert. Well, Desert comes in two versions for very good reason. That'll come to in a minute. Desert Plus version 3.2.7 and 4.1.10, that's the latest. 3.2.7 is kept as legacy, specifically because it is CDSG claims tested. Uh, that's a UK government GCHQ accreditation scheme that says that the British government can use this. Uh, if you actually look at what constitutes CCTN, you very quickly come to the conclusion, very obvious conclusion, based on very simple presuppositions. The CCTN is just a technique whereby vendors pay money for accreditation. It basically provides a false sense of security to users you know, paid for by the vendor. Uh, there's another name for that in the UK, it's called pen testing. I don't know what you call that in Sweden, uh, since I don't speak Sweden. Okay. This <coughs> basically runs on everything apart from the before it seems quite often to see that. It provides file and virtual disk encryption. Also full disk encryption, but only if you buy the business version. Apparently only business versions, uh, business users want on full disk encryption. Developed by Data Encryption Systems Limited, <coughs> the chairman, Ben Jones, director David Tomlinson, uh, who we've spoken about. Uh, it was started by Ben Jones, who was ex-Navy Communications and GCHQ. One thing you should know about the British government of is nepotism. Uh, they are extremely nepotistic. Uh, if you happen to work with GCHQ, you will come out there with a cryptographic product of some kind, and you will get government uh, grants, and you probably will get government contract. You know, it's the British equivalent of Halliburton, basically. Okay, so we'll move on. <coughs> if you're on user mode, addresses in kernel mode code, uh, there are so many instances this in virtually every single driver, I just simply can't go through them all or enumerate them all. It was not never my intention to be uh, completely uh, complete, that is to document every vulnerability, I'll leave that to the community. Uh, so Microsoft state this is handling user mode pointers incorrectly can result in the following, corruption of kernel data structures or writing to arbitrary kernel addresses, <coughs> which can cause crashes or compromise security. So, how does Desert fare against that? Well, as it happens, not well. I did consider videos, uh, but I didn't do them for two reasons. One, I'm rather lazy, and two, uh, you can get the source code for this anyway, so if you want to know how it works, or find the bug yourself, it's relatively trivial. Uh, 
the expert on the left, if you can see, works on version 404. I actually tried to get them onto version 404 by trickling them bugs, trying to get them to release a version that wasn't found. But uh, they actually didn't bother fixing this bug, which was actually the last bug I sent them. And this was about two years ago. Uh, this one still works in all versions. Uh, it's never been patched, and unlikely it ever will be patched. Uh, so that's pretty useful. Yeah, it's going across the box and the a lot. Uh, this is another one. Uh, this one has been patched, probably because it's just so blatantly stupid to fall for something like this. Uh, it give you a bit of explanation. This is basically a user mode uh, supplied pointer. It's actually just called from the driver, so you don't even have to bother with anything. You just have to, have to, just have to set up the, uh, the data structures in a particular way. Uh, I did notice about late, very late last night, so I didn't actually get into the hotel until about 1 o'clock in the morning, that I didn't put any uh, on this. Uh, pretty much everything is an integer apart from Pan, uh, which is a character. Uh, you'll quite often find that in Xbox I write. When you see uh, Pan, it basically means I can't be bothered figuring out what those parts of the data, what those parts of the buffer actually do. Uh, so here you just see basically the values require request our pointer pointing to another uh, block of memory, etc. etc. Get current process ID, you have to fill it. And basically, whatever you put in function here is called from kernel mode, which really does mean that you are a dumbass and you should go and sit in the corner. These are bugs that you really should be suffering from. And just imagine what would actually happen if, if a BSD developer actually fell for these bugs. It, it, it just doesn't bear thinking about you know BSD, you know, copy in, copy out, user user mode, user user mode pointers, even an IREX uses something like that, uses that, means you've got source code, which is weak. Probably explain to why so many books are found by LSD. It's another story. <coughs> but uh, it would really be a good idea if something like that were implemented for Windows. Even if someone just wrote a, wrote a library on the side and just said, look, developers, you obviously can't use, use no pointers correctly. We'll do it for you. Uh, that would probably be a great help to developers. Uh, we'll move on to dry crypt. DriveCrypt is an interesting one, uh, primarily because this is one I know most about. I know most about it because the developer actually emailed me back, the only guy that did. Uh, current version is not 5.3, it's 5.4, although everything still works in 5.4, because 5.4 is the new Windows 7 compatibility, which I haven't bothered to update. It provides everything, yeah, again, full disk encryption, virtual disk. Developed by SecureStar. Uh, the chairman is Wilfred Hafner, an interesting guy, he was a convicted criminal. Uh, doesn't like to say that on his website. He described himself as a computer security expert. Well, the uh, the uh, German government didn't think he was much of a computer expert when they said he was rather foolish to commit the same crime twice. He got away with it the first time. Uh, unfortunately, they said if he wasn't so big now as goddamn greedy, he would have got away with it again, but he just kept on going. Uh, Wire for uh, Secure Star GmbH is a German computer security company uh, founded by Wolfgang Hacker, presumably after he got out of prison. Uh, it was developed on top of Scram Disk, which was another invention of Sean Hollingworth, who's an interesting guy. He used to write games. <laughs> he used to write games for the uh, Z80 Spectrum. Uh, and also the Amiga, which apparently, if you're a Z80 Spectrum assembler, you know, basically mean the skills are transferable, basically. You know, Z80 game development, with <coughs> game development, pretty much the same thing. It's just different kind of discipline. And it really does show. It really, really, really does show. I mean, I actually have quotes, and I'll read them to you from this guy. He's an interesting guy. He's just a bit, has a few misconceptions. Okay, so, uh, it's an interesting quote from them. Basically, they claim that this is used everywhere, including New Scotland Yard. Which was interesting because somebody I spoke to actually worked at New Scotland Yard and he hadn't heard of it. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers was in there and they've not heard of it either. Uh, so I doubt that many of these actually even run. I mean, Shell and Exxon competitors, why would we do the same thing? Okay, user mode access is in kernel mode code. I don't need to go any further than this. Uh, two things you should see about this slide. One, the name of the DLL itself, dc5 underscore dll dot dll. Such a good DLL, he named it twice. 
<laughs> if you look halfway, halfway down here, you actually see a function exported from it. This is the SDK. Uh, quite why you need a function to crash the driver, I don't quite know. <laughs> but that, if you actually reverse that, and note that driver can be only people to use anti-reverse engineering techniques. Uh, so you, once you've stripped off the way, there are minor inconvenience, but once you've stripped off the way, you actually see what crash driver actually does. And it actually just supplies a null pointer to one of the many pointers that are just used for baiting, and use the null buffers. And you actually see other things here, here that are interesting. DC fire operation. And we guess what that one does. I'll come to that one in a minute. That was particularly interesting and really does demonstrate a lack of understanding. Uh, other ones are check hidden disk suitability, which kind of tells you why you shouldn't use this if you wish your disks to be hidden. Uh, but then again, this is an SDK. Uh, apparently, you have to pay for the information for this. Uh, in actual, I will get around the documents and if anyone wants to help, we can. And uh, there's probably countless other instances. So I'll read you one quote from this guy, uh, actually copied to my trusty crack page, that uh, will tell you uh, what he thinks about uh, use of all pointers in code on one code. Uh, apparently they don't constitute a vulnerability. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that, only for him that is. Uh, and that is because he supplies the pointers. Uh, I supply them myself. Why should I need to probe them for validity? I would no emphasis, it is a valid pointer as I sent it. The same applies to any other pointers of this type. The driver isn't intended for other people to make calls, and only, only emphasis connects to secure star code. There is an SDK for people who want to control the thing themselves, which works via a DLL, presumably this. Uh, and we don't therefore expect people to pass the value pointers to our drivers, so we never felt the need to probe our buffers. He then goes on to say, in any case, a blue screen would result, which he preferred actually. Uh, unfortunately, not always blue screen, it just depends on if you exploit crashes. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand that actually supplying the DLL as an SDK actually allows people to send their own buffers. Uh, so he is actually still giving them access to the driver, he just doesn't quite understand why he is. And he really should go and sit in the corner because he is a dumbass. I mean, that says, that's, I've never seen anything like that before, providing the need to crash your own driver. Anyway, uh, this is another one that he says isn't a vulnerability. This is just your typical buffer overflow, which are just rife in uh, pretty much all of these implementations, with the exception of two, and I'll come to those later. Uh, you should always validate your buffer lens. You know, maybe Microsoft will take their own advice at some point. Uh, there's a print buffer overruns and underruns. Well, he says there are none of these as well. Uh, and the reason for that is just by bit. He just states it. There are no buffer overruns, because I know there are. Uh, well, it turns out to be wrong, but uh, blatantly wrong. I mean, there are many instances of this. It's just your typical buffer overruns, so I won't go into it. So it's called available. It's available for this, has been for some time. Uh, still works on all the latest versions. So there you go. Uh, one thing to note here that's actually quite interesting is the uh, drive version. Uh, that string there is provided by the driver on every call to the driver, and it's actually written to a user supply pointer as well, without any validation on any device IO control you actually use. So the operative word is that can't be bothered fuzzing these things simply because any request will crash the box. It's just random data. Any. The chances of you not crashing it are minuscule. And I hate them. Someone might want to calculate the probability on the average program of the memory usage of actually not crashing this program. God knows how many people have randomly managed to crash it just using it normally. I hate to guess. This is another interesting one. Uh, drive trip. There are a couple of other implementations that suffer with bugs like this, but not to the same extent, so I'll use this one as a demonstration. Uh, Microsoft State handles received from user mode should not be passed to ZW. And the X obviously just replace whatever you want, create file, new file, write file. When the ZW kernel mode routine runs the previous processor mode is kernel, all access checks are disabled. That's not entirely true. Uh, it depends on how you create the handle. Uh, you can create it with an uh, object force check, I believe, or something like that, but no one ever does. Uh, they certainly don't, anyway. Similarly, calls to ZW create file or open file with file names provided to the driver will successfully create open files that should be denied to the caller. 
it's a, does he suffer with this? Well, as it happens, yes. Uh, here you have an example at the top line guest. Uh, I try to open the repair sign, access is denied. I use the exploit, I open C Windows repair sign, it gives me the handle. Done, I read from the file using the direct, using the, I have to know that I have to use the kernel driver to read the file. I can't do it from user land because the actually specified object kernel handle. So you can only use the handle within the context of the kernel, but you seemingly forgot to force the checks. Uh, you gave me a reason for this book existing as well, which is also quite interesting and indicative of his way of thinking. He says that this one isn't a book either, uh, or at least not a security book, uh, because this one actually has good intentions. Uh, namely, uh, it has good intentions because it's designed to uh, oppress their users. In other words, it's for licensing. Uh, he says that that file access code is specifically uh, to deal with the licensing. If Microsoft had allowed processors to write their own emphasis, folders elevated or not, the proper place for associated data apparently, we wouldn't have needed to add this stuff. In other words, what you've done is you've decided to install his license on the machine, uh, read one multiple system only, but then hit upon the strange catch-22 situation whereby actual users are going to be using the program and not going to have system privileges. So how do you read a file over one and write one only to system? Well, it's simple, you backed all the curve with, read, but with uh, file access permissions to just completely avoid file permissions. And you do it knowingly and wantonly, and you actually supply complete API to do it, to open files, write to files, read anything you write from files at any offset. It's quite a complex uh, uh, API, which uses a vast amount of user supply pointers, and yes, you guess that none of them are checked. Uh, but it is reverse engineerable and it is usable. Uh, so if you actually, funnily enough, you actually use this properly, uh, you don't even, if you're another user on the same machine and another user has an encrypted file uh, or encrypted volume open, you don't even need his password to read the files. As you probably guess, you can just read from any device now. Oh, that's a feature, yeah. yeah. But that's standard. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely standard. I mean, he goes on to say here, we can probably remove the read aspect from it and use create file with generic read uh, only, which will allow us to read what we need without the kernel code being called to do it for us. He goes on, and then he goes on to self-contradict and say, I might possibly have to leave the kernel write code in for now, however, but the service could possibly do that in the future. So he might remove the write code, but he needs to leave it in as long, well, and he's left it in for over a year now, so presumably he can't be bothered removing it. So, We'll move on uh, to safeguard privacy. This, this is actually on Wells Bit by Automate, but it's now Softbox. Uh, so this is really what Softbox is probably just inherited. It. This one's strange and it runs on its software version as well. I'm not certain about the latest version, and the time checking is 5.3, it's probably a lot higher than that now. Or change to version 9, or something like that, 12, or something like that. Let's try and make it look new. Uh, well, this one also. So for some buffer overflows, it's incredibly difficult to exploit. This exploit was written a long time ago. Uh, I won't really go into that one because that one's not publicly available, and probably never will be, unless someone gets off their backside and decides that they will actually disclose it, uh, at which point the exploit will be publicly available. It's fine to say it does suffer with such vulnerabilities. Uh, another one is logic files, which are right from behind this. Uh, for some reason, uh, they the developers hit one strange problem whereby maybe it's legitimate for another user of the machine to issue device IO control requests to another user's mounted disk device. So another user, got two users, A and B, A, B, A mounts a disk, it's got some device now, B wants to send device IO control messages to it. Why would you do that? We well, can't access it directly, obviously, that'd be bloody stupid, it's something that only Desmond would suffer from. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to implement the functionality to reroute the I/O control request through the kernel to the other device. You know, I mean, that just makes sense. Well, to be uh, this is just an example of it. What you have here is uh, we have another user A who has mounted uh, this device C document and settings uh, administrator my documents and uh, And this user is guest. He's on the same box. Uh, unfortunately, he's not nice to destroy all your data. Well, that's not a problem, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, if you actually read the uh, definitions. We know that Atlas used BCRIP because that's public knowledge as well as published. Yet again, we should be told the truth. Uh, this was founded in 2001 by Bernard Pearson and Nigel Lee, yet more British government nepotism, and it's also CCTM approved. It's also CAPS approved, which is another CESG accreditation. Uh, it's used for enhanced security. So basically, if you you would use BCRIP if you're MI5 or MI6 or GCHQ themselves. CAPS approval is just about the highest you can get. Uh, BCRIP goes all the way up to top secret uh, data. Uh, some versions only secret, there are two versions enhanced, uh, disprotected, disprotected, enhanced. I've never managed to get hold of a copy of the enhanced version. Uh, the guy who has it has tested it and he says vulnerabilities do work. Uh, however, he won't give me copies because they still do implement uh, CSG private algorithms, which basically means if I have got my hands on them, don't know what happened, uh, which is probably tells you why I have an unhealthy interest in cryptography. I actually want to get my hands on it. Okay, so we simple inch and draw for in this one. Uh, obviously, inch and draw for is up here. Uh, ECX is the LP input buffer, so we just read an arbitrary D word from it, do a simple calculation, and multiply and allocate that many bytes. Further down, we actually use the buffer, so that's where the corruption actually occurs. Uh, there is a much easier uh, there is a much easier vulnerability to exploit, and that's actually down here. Uh, that's the fact that these two uh, pointers here are actually user definable as well using another IO control interface. Uh, however, in every mem copy there is no uh, lens check at all. So it doesn't matter if you allocate the rest bytes here and this value here. So if you just send in a large request to the first IO control handler, set a large size, take the call to this with a small size, and corrupt itself instantly. Which is pretty much why it makes it exploitable. To exploit the integer overflow at the top is, would be extremely difficult if you actually knew the code further down, which would be too difficult to explain. Okay, and that's basically the result. Uh, it doesn't really tell you much other than the fact that the runner is guessed uh, and the machine is just completely uh, corrupted. Okay, so vulnerability table. This is what we've got so far in the actual table, it would probably be a lot bigger if you could break it down far more books and uh, far more uh, implementations. There's a lot drive grip to private disk, pretty much take the biscuit. Uh, safe bit is pretty much the best. Best script is bad but not that bad. And big script it should be good. Uh, it turns out not to be. Probably quite surprising. The guys from Big Crypt are very anxious to get hold of the books simply because although CSG just simply do not care about CCTN accredited software and books contained within it. I know they don't care because I actually emailed them and said, look, there's what, you just accredited it. It's a terrible piece of software. Please get rid of the accreditation. Uh, they never replied to that email, although I know for a fact they read it. And I know for a fact they read it because in the email I actually told them that there was a typo in HREF on their front page where publications was typo to all publications without the P. Uh, that was fixed two hours later. Uh, they never replied. Uh, so they did read it and they do know about it, they just choose to ignore it. Better to take the money, obviously, you know, with the fiscal situation as it is, it's better to take a thousand pounds or something like that, because that's a big dent off the 160 billion pound deficit. This is no way I like to think about it. I'm really I'm sorry for the to anybody who happens to be a creationist in the audience. I read a book yesterday that tells me that 86% of Americans are creationists, which is why I've included this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's a good reason. It's yeah. included because if I don't, really don't want to offend anyone who happens to be a creationist. And this just, you can just ignore the monkeys in this case. You know, we went from somebody who's got a dumb basement book on the face to a human being, so obviously there's what they really were doing when you wrote this. So basically this is the monkeyometer, as I like to call it. So I basically just like to put things on this. You can imagine that these people, you know, the upright guy there happens to be the developer. So I'll say a bit, you know, he's more human than beat it. Drive trip to private to say this whole course. And Deslock, even though they're not as bad as drive trip, just for the hassle they call you know, for the in the little monkey category. And presumably Darwin didn't realise that that monkey does look like he's all very homosexual when he's dancing like that. If that just seems like a dance, you can understand why you should be closer to him under the bottom line. Okay, so conclusions. 
a thesis one and two. Uh, if you have pretty much any of these installed, you pretty much, pretty much any actually installed them, pretty are uh, giving uh, trivial means for our activity. I mean, these are export functionality and users, any user, in fact, yes, anybody. Uh, and pretty much all of them include the export Well, thesis three obviously holds. Uh, because the only ideal logs and sales can believe the extra software is a solution to too much complexity or too much software, which is just a synonym for security. Really. Too much complexity, too much software, and get more software to solve the problem. Well, thesis four, uh, that one goes without saying, really, uh, released about 10 plus exploits for numerous implementations of this. It uh, listed precisely zero comment by anybody, in fact, by anybody. I mean, that's for very good principled reasons. Because you just have to consider the case where they do actually make a, a comment or they do take an interest. Uh, I'm not saying that disk encryption software products are advertising <coughs> everything else, but just Win32 kernel drives in general. But the reason why you'll just simply see no comment about Win32 kernel driver exports is because they're just so prevalent, they're everywhere. Uh, it's just, you know, it's the rule, it's not the exception. As such, if, you know, if you take from that to if you have to stay damn good into the register, if he paid it one tenth of the interest, as he obviously does, where it comes out of his mouth, to anything related to the things you turn up, but you, you, know, you just have nothing else to read. Uh, only two patches ever came from vendors, uh, one, both of which were deadlock, uh, one of which didn't actually fix anything as I stated before, they actually lied about that. Uh, there are other crypto related bugs, and still no one has figured out that in here. It's, uh, there's a rather interesting book in Sub Solaris, Greater Equal to 10, all versions of Open Solaris. Uh, it's only explored when you've actually got a hardware crypto on device. Uh, it can say we had to actually pointed to where it was. Uh, some have yet to fix it. No one has managed to figure it out yet, even though the code, even though the function that it's actually used is actually said in the, in the conference slides. You just download the slides, it's just right in front of it. Okay, well, of course, further products are of interest. To give you an example, full the, the checkpoint. Some of these I've just never managed to get hold of. DGP obviously can get hold of. Uh, one of them, Port Coast Guardian Angel. Uh, this was one of those that is no longer for sale, but was CAPS approved. Uh, say no copy available, because no copy was available at the time, but I have now got a copy. And I've since proved that Port Coast Guardian Angel was a waste of time. No wonder it got removed from the market rather quickly. Uh, the reason for that, really, to give you one example, they claim to be able to protect the disk boot block of the machine. Well, the method it actually uses to do that is it's just simple obfuscation. It obfuscates it with the driver boots up and de obfuscates it when the driver shuts down, which is quite interesting because it tells you just how much work you would actually have to maintain machines running this. If a machine actually blue screen, what does it do? It can't boot up with an obfuscated boot block. Well, you've actually got to go around and put a disk in the drive and actually you know, reset the boot block each and every time you do it. Well, that shows you just how bad Guardian Angel actually was. But it was interesting because it implements CSG password encryption algorithms, which are still believed to be private. This is a challenge I'd like to set to anybody who's actually interested in things like this. And the two, CSG Logfire and CSG uh, FireGuard, both do the same thing, one-way password encryption algorithms. Unfortunately, Paul Coyce kind of got it round the wrong way when he actually wrote this piece, the obvious piece of propaganda. It's still on the site, actually. It basically says that it cannot be reverse engineered. You know, if anyone wants to take up that challenge, that's actually pretty easy. You can give you a binary, I'll give you the definition of the algorithm. Much to see SG's hatred and problem my own prison. But, you know, I'll try. And I'll finish there. The references. If anybody wants to actually prove any of the uh, quotes. Uh, quite numerous throughout it, and you're quite welcome to do so. Any other questions? Yeah, I actually have a tradition here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have a little bit of tradition here because Swedes don't usually ask questions right away. And the easiest way to do that is for me to get on stage and start asking questions. Now we don't have, as usual, we don't have microphones on each seat. We used to have that. But we have one microphone here, and I'm told there's another one. Am I right? 
Oh, not right. This means that I'll ask a few questions and then I will walk around with a microphone. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, so the first thing I, I mean, first thing I was thinking about, what was the most common mistake that you see that everybody makes? I would use the Sprite contents most definitely. Yeah. Uh, people just don't even read the uh, API. It's quite incredible. Uh, first instance where Desoc actually did patch one of those. The uh, use code for read, you can use it in a completely invalid way. The API actually tells you how you're supposed to use it with this. There's obviously no other reason. Uh, there are actually instances where you've got two pieces of code that are obviously the same, so you can't do it with the same function, pile and line and etc. But you can virtually tell that from the locality. And you see it here where he checks it, here where he just doesn't bother. And it's, it's, it's just quite hilarious. Uh, it's actually very interesting. Um, uh, the other thing I was thinking about, if you disregard the Ray Comfort um, violation of evolution being true and so forth, um, is there anybody that actually does it right? I mean, have you, do you uh, see any product that actually is doing things I, obviously right that you can find in any drive? I believe it was a VPN drive that I looked at by UAP and MCP and MCP. Don't worry, that's answer. Uh, they actually did it properly. They suffer from another denial of service, but you could only access that if you're an admin, so it just didn't bother uh, looking at it after that. Only interested in ones you can access other than other people's users for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, Cisco did get it quite right with their VPN drive, but there were other faults in that. Uh, Terministic network extension was a new one, although Cisco knew about that one for about six months before CERT released an advisory on it, and it didn't do anything about it, nor did he even admit it was vulnerable to it. Uh, Stating that it wasn't echo. Citrix actually bought the service to network extender, they now look after it, and they described the vulnerability as uh, something that wasn't of any importance. Uh, even though CERT released an advisory for it, it's only just a good use of implementation of VPN that we used to it. Uh, right, also, I know a lot of people probably use Shortcut. Have you used anything on that? Yeah. Uh, that's open source. I'm only interested in closed source. The, the, reason, the reason is very simple and principle. In closed source, you can get over a lot of that. You can see the kind of world in open source. I mean, if anybody saw it, I mean, you might say it was a big one. just didn't. I mean, just think about the furore that happened when uh, the VMs was in Linux. I mean, that was just blatant. I mean, you imagine that every single day, in every drive that you looked at, in every place. Uh, you just simply don't get the same amount of variety. Two could just simply couldn't get away with it. Their, their Windows drive is actually done correctly. Namely, they don't even, they do it the old fashioned way with IO controls and don't supply content, which is very good. Some RPC has, has a lot of things wrong with it, but a lot of things are right with it, especially to do with data marshalling. Marshalling your data in a static block in a very specific way, strings with length, string, null terminated. Fine, read it like that, don't send pointers around the place because you just get it basically. So, uh, Windows developers just need to like complexity a lot. Unfortunately, they're not the clever enough down the road. You see more problems with people inputting full disk encryption versus virtual disk encryption? No, all the same. Thank you.